Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Deborah Royal. I'm the Chief of Staff and Communications Director for Oregon's Secretary of State. On average, one Oregonian dies every three days due to the misuse of prescription opioids. Please take a moment to let that sink in. One Oregonian every three days. We're here today for these victims, their families and friends. Oregon has an opportunity to learn from the experiences of other states and follow the best practices being successfully implemented across the nation. So many families are being shattered by the opioid epidemic. We have to act with determination to stop it where we can. I'd like to tell you my family's story. Four years ago, my nephew took a fatal mixture of drugs that included opioids. Alex was 29. He was the first grandchild in my family and was my dad, his grandfather's best friend. Alex was smart and talented. He was handsome and funny. He was our family's go-to guy when you ever had a problem with your plumbing. Alex was also an addict. In 1986, two months after he was born, my sister and, her, and my brother-in-law made the choice to put Alex in daycare so my sister could return to work. But Grandpa was old school and was having none of that. He was a tough guy, but such a softy when it came to his little ones. My dad had an extremely hard childhood. He grew up on the streets of Newark, New Jersey during the Depression. He was a combat medic in the Korean War and for 35 years, he was a diesel mechanic working the graveyard shift, repairing Safeway's big rigs, tractor trailers. He was tough, but he didn't want Alex in daycare. So every morning after work, he would pick Alex up at 7 a.m. and deliver him home at 6 p.m. Those six years that he was Alex's caregiver, my dad slept an average of four hours a night. My mom would tell me how tired he would be when he left for work each night at 10.30 p.m. She was especially worried about him during the winters. He spent many frigid nights going out on road calls to repair 18-wheelers that had broken down on the shoulders of some of the busiest highways in America. He, it was dangerous and <coughs> exhausting work. But when the sun came up, he would be with Alex. He would be at a petting zoo, he would be building birdhouses, or he'd be fishing in the same pond where he taught my sister and I and me how to fish when we were little. Fast forward to another frigid night in January of 2015. My dad, then 84 years old and long since retired, stopped by Alex's apartment to retrieve a tool Alex had borrowed earlier in the week. My dad walked past Alex's car and noticed the tool in the back seat. The car was unlocked, so he opened the door and took the tool. Alex's kitchen light was on in his apartment, but it was cold and it was late, and my dad was a little bit angry that Alex had left an expensive tool in an unlocked car. So instead of going to Alex's apartment, he went home and called him in the morning. There was no answer, so he left a voicemail. Alex didn't return the call. He wasn't returning anyone's calls. So the following morning, my sister and my brother-in-law went to check on him. They found him on his kitchen floor. He was dead. The coroner placed the time of death somewhere around the time my dad was standing in the parking lot looking up at Alex's kitchen window. My dad was an army medic. He knew how to save lives. He knew what to do to keep Alex alive until the EMTs arrived. What he didn't know that time, Alex would need the time Alex would need him the most would be the time my dad said, I'm too tired. These are the types of unt untold stories that haunt the families of this opioid nightmare. The what ifs, the if onlys. My dad still tortures himself. What if it what if I hadn't been cold? What if I hadn't been tired? I spent my life being cold and tired. Why was tonight any different? I only, if only I hadn't been angry 
Maybe I could have saved him. There are far too many families in Oregon and across this country who understand exactly what I'm talking about. They suffer along with their loved one while they're alive, but their suffering doesn't end. Guilt, loneliness, sorrow, replace the space where the loved one used to be. My dad would have done anything to save Alex. So today, you will hear about things we can do to save more of our fellow Oregonians from this dreadful epidemic. This audit outlines concrete solutions to help reduce the heartbreaking devastation of the opioid crisis. It's too late for Alex, but it's not too late for many others. We have a moral imperative to take action. Next, you'll hear from our audit director, Kit Mehmet. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kip Memmott, M-E-M-M-O-T-T. -T. I'm the Audits Director for the Secretary of State's Office. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you to Deb for sharing that uh, personal story. That's what our audits are about. They look like bureaucratic, technically filled uh, information and, and, and government kind of reports, but they really are about people. And we are really excited to present an audit today on the, on the state's uh, prescription drug monitoring program that we believe have some real uh, substantive recommendations to help Oregon get through this really severe crisis we're facing right now. Um, I, before, I'm going to turn it over to Jamie Rawls, who was the audit manager on the engagement, to give you a briefing on our key findings and recommendations. Uh, but before I do that, I just do want to acknowledge a few people. I want to acknowledge the audit team, Jamie Rawls, Karen Peterson, and Kathy Davis, the audit team who actually worked on this, and we had a bunch of support staff as well. I think if you, uh, when you read the report, you'll see the quality and, and the depth of, of our, our audit work on this really important issue. Lastly, before I turn it over to Jamie, I want to recognize Pat Allen, the director of Oregon Health Authority, and his team uh, for their collaboration and cooperation on this audit. This audit, this uh, epidemic, is not a one solution kind of issue, as we all know. The prescription drug monitoring program is a key tool in the kit the state has to help battle this, but it's not the only tool, and it's not the, the only thing that if we fix this, we're going we're gonna to be well on our way. There's a lot more work to do, and we want to acknowledge that, but we want to tip our hat to our our uh, co-workers over at OHA for the hard work they do in this space. So having said that, I'll turn over to Jamie for the briefing and then we'll be available for some questions and answers uh, after she finishes her comments. Thank you. Thanks, Kip. Good afternoon. As Kip mentioned, my name is Jamie Rawls. I was the audit manager on the audit. I'm gonna start off with some troubling statistics that prompted us to do this audit. Oregon, like the rest of the nation, is in the midst of an opioid crisis. The <coughs> issue impacts everyone, from infants to children to seniors. For infants, in 2016, almost 500 pregnancies in Oregon were complicated by maternal opioid use, and 280 infants were bor born with neonatal abstinence syndrome. From 2015 to 2017, 314 more children entered foster care due to a parent's drug abuse. Nationally, Oregon has the sixth highest percentage of teenagers with substance use disorder. And for seniors, Oregon has the highest rate in the nation of seniors hospitalized for opioid-related issues. The median cost for each of those hospitalizations is $13,000. Opioids can be helpful in addressing pain with appropriate medical oversight, but they're highly addictive. Dependence on prescription opioids can occur in less than a week, and taking a low-dose prescription of an opioid of more than three, for more than three months raises the risk 15-fold. When it comes to providing access to treatment for those with substance use disorders, Oregon ranks last for adults and second to last for adolescents. Oregon has made progress in dispensing fewer opioid prescriptions over recent years, but our state still prescribes opioids at a rate of 13% higher than the national average and the U.S. prescribes more than other comparable countries. The Oregon Health Authority reported approximately 7 million prescriptions for controlled substances were dispensed annually, with over half of those being for opioids. Our audit focused on an important tool that all 50 states use to help combat the opioid crisis. It's called the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, or the PDMP. 
<coughs> PDMPs maintain an electronic database of prescription information collected directly from pharmacies in an effort to provide physicians and pharmacists with critical information regarding a patient's prescription history. PDMPs also allow tracking of physicians prescribing practices to help state authorities create informed guidelines and other efforts to improve addiction, prevention, and treatment. OHA oversees Oregon's PDMP. It was enacted in 2009 and started collecting prescription information in late 2011. The big takeaway from this audit is that Oregon laws prevent the use of a number of leading practices many other states have incorporated into their PDMP. Compared to other states, Oregon's PDMP collects less information, it's used less effectively, and it doesn't allow key players access to information. Our first key finding was that OHA could better use the PDMP data to analyze trends in prescribed drugs, including identifying patterns of possible opioid misuse and abuse. State laws prevent OHA from sharing information with key stakeholders, such as health licensing boards and law enforcement on questionable activity. Our second key finding is that there is no requirement for prescribers to use the PDMP. Oregon is one of only nine states that does not require prescribers or pharmacists to use the PDMP database before an opioid is prescription is written or dispensed. Finally, we found that OHA is not collecting some prescription information that could be critical to preventing prescription drug abuse, including Schedule 5 drugs, method of payment, and diagnosis code. The PDMB data shows questionable activity that has been occurring in Oregon for years, but the state laws limit OHA's ability to investigate and mitigate such activity. By reviewing three years' worth of data from Oregon's PDMP, we found multiple instances of potential doctor shopping, dangerous drug combinations, and a growing trend of prescription stimulants used by many age groups. For potential doctor shoppers, we identified 148 people who received controlled substance prescriptions from 30 or more different prescribers and filled their prescriptions at 15 or more pharmacies within our three-year time frame. The average person received controlled substances prescriptions from two different prescribers and filled their prescriptions at two different pharmacies. In contrast, the most egregious doctor shopper received opioid prescriptions from over 200 different prescribers and visited 75 different pharmacies for these prescriptions. When we analyzed the prescribers who wrote these prescriptions, we found most of them were dentists. One person was prescribed opioids by 218 different dentists out of 232 total prescribers. For dangerous drug combinations, we found instances where people were receiving opioids, benzos, and muscle relaxants. When combined, these three drugs, the total effect of these three drugs is greater than the sum of the individual effects. Our data analysis revealed 4,270 people who were prescribed this dangerous combination. Over the course of 36 months, we found that 864 individuals had been prescribed all three for at least 10 months. Our analysis also found over 34,000 people received a combination of two of these drugs, benzos and opioids, for over 10 months or more. We also found an alarming trend for prescription stimulants that is occurring in many age groups in Oregon. Due to its rapid growth nationally, addiction to stimulants is forecasted to be the next drug epidemic. Another medication, Zolpidem, commonly prescribed under the brand name Ambien, has been used as a date rape drug. In analyzing Oregon's PDMP data, we also found instances of potentially excessive quantities of this drug. For example, one person received over a 1,500 days supply of a controlled substance from five different prescribers in a single year. Currently, OHA does not share this information with law enforcement. We also found another increasing trend of gabapentin. When taken with prescription or illicit opioids, it enhances the euphoric effect. When taken alone in high doses, gabapentin can produce a marijuana-like high. In 2017, prescriptions for gabapentin with Oregon's Medicaid program rose by 50% from the prior year and followed closely behind prescriptions for oxycodone. Oregon does not track this drug in the PDMP. However, other states have included this within the substances tracked and monitored. 
Oregon's PDMP is not allowed to evaluate prescriber practices and prescribing habits among peers. Some states, but not Oregon, produce prescriber report cards using the PDMP data. These show practitioners how their prescribing practices compare to their peers within their medical specialty. For example, a family physician can compare their prescribing behaviors to the average doctor. Oregon statute prevents report cards, as these would be considered evaluating a prescriber's practice, which is prohibited. Another area of significant concern is that some types of pharmacies are excluded from the PDMP altogether. This creates significant concern. For example, over the course of one month, an individual was prescribed 354 tablets of oxycodone and 171 tablets of clozapam by three different doctors. Because some of the prescriptions were filled at exempted pharmacies, they were not included in the patient's PDMP history. Almost all states have moved to daily or next day business reporting to PDMP by pharmacies when someone purchases a prescription drug. Oregon has a 72 hour reporting period. This delay extends the window and risk of problematic activity like doctor and pharmacy shopping by those misusing and abusing prescription drugs. Also problematic, the current PDMP program is not adequately following up on entries with errors. Instead, those entries remain in limbo without being part of the system. The audit found some data submissions that have been on hold for years. Incomplete data reduces the effectiveness of the entire program. Veterinarian prescribed controlled substances are also exempt from being reported to the PDMP. Nationally, veterinarians have reported concerning cases of pet owners intentionally harming their pets to get drugs. This has occurred in multiple states, including Oregon. Although some veterinarian prescriptions were found in Oregon's PDMP database, the state does not make it a requirement. 18 other states collect this information. Other states collect prescription detail beneficial to understanding and addressing substance misuse and abuse issues that Oregon does not. 46 states PDMPs collect the method of payment from their programs. This would be instances like Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance, or by paying with cash from the individual. This can help flag suspicious activity. Nearly 40 states have expanded the dispensed prescriptions they collect to include all Schedule 5 drugs. This allows them to monitor the trends of all the controlled substances listed in the Controlled Substances Act. Oregon currently does not collect this information. When we compared Oregon to neighboring states, we found that each of those states' PDMP has instituted at least five leading practices. Oregon has not implemented any of them. Our recommendations to OHA are broken into two categories. The first category are actions that the agency can take within existing state laws. Examples of these recommendations are to get all the required prescribers registered with the PDMP, update their specialty information, share data with the Medicaid program, and ensure prescription information is complete. The second category of our recommendations are for OHA to work with the legislature to expand state laws. Examples of these recommendations include performing more data analysis, proactively sharing data with licensing boards and law enforcement, requiring pres prescribers to use the PDMP, and collecting more prescription information. All 12 of the recommendations can be seen in their entirety at the end of our audit report, along with OHA's responses. OHA agreed with all of the recommendations that stated because seven of them fall outside of their scope of statutory authority, their, inability, their ability to implement them is limited. We would be happy to answer any questions at this point that you may have. I'm gonna call Kip Mimit back up. Well, why is Oregon lacking behind so many other states in the monitoring and all that? What's the reason? Oregon hasn't been proactively looking at what they can be doing. I think our um, state had, you know, back when they implemented the law, they wanted to take baby steps and, and kind of start the program, slowly start adding people to be using it, but it's just really lagged. It hasn't taken up um, a lot of momentum. And honestly, I don't know if they're looking at what other states are doing that they can be implementing. This question may be from left field, but our pharmaceutical interests and the, and the big amounts of money that they have a factor? It definitely could be. I know that the legislature has had this bill come up in the past to expand parts of the PDMP and it hasn't passed and it could be because of um, a lot of other interest groups. I, given that a lot of these changes 
a lot of these recommendations would require changes to state law. Were any of these findings a surprise at all um, a after you assembled it, considering what the law is? Uh, it was surprising when we looked at other states how narrowing our law is. It really limits their ability to, um, to do a lot. And I'll just add to that, you know, one reason it got on our plan is, you know, obviously there's an opioid e epidemic nationally. The governor has declared an emergency state here in Oregon, so we obviously have some compelling reasons to do it. But as we did our risk assessment for auto plan, we looked at who is really, what are the entities overseeing this? Oregon Health Authority had the PDMP. And so that's where we kind of honed into, and, and that's why we got there. But, but your question about um, in terms of why the state hasn't moved, one thing we acknowledge uh, in our report, we want to make sure there's privacy issues here in play, right? We're talking about patients, their, their medical histories, uh, their use of prescription drugs. So we understand that, we acknowledge that. Uh, there are some, some interests that, that are concerned about those privacy issues, but our recommendations actually account for, obviously we want to account for that balance, but these same groups who may oppose it here are usually national type groups that, and these other states have been able to compel to their legislative bodies a more robust PDMP system. So uh, I think there's, but just to ask a question, I think there's a lot of concern in Oregon about privacy, maybe as opposed to other states, the emphasis on that. There are a lot of um, mitigating controls that other states have put in place to make sure that you don't have, you know, law enforcement roguely looking in a, a data set and there's you know, every, every time someone logs in, it's monitored. You have to get a login and, rec and register, and then someone can look and see what you're looking at, why you're looking at it. There's requirements in place, so there's a lot of controls to make sure it's not being abused. Um, since uh, this program appears to be kind of weak and narrow, does it have, like, any material value right now? for the money that licensees are paying? Yeah, we, I mean, we found, we were able to get the data, although OHA doesn't seem they can do this within the realm of their statute, but we were able to get the data and it was a wealth of information. There's things they could definitely expand upon and collect that would give more information, like doctor specialty and, um, and different other things, you know, method of payment, but there's a wealth of information at your fingertips within the data set right now. And just going back to like the law changes and what the data currently allows, I mean, how much the uh, Assuming laws were to be changed, how much additional technology or programming would be needed in order to accomplish what you're recommending? The agency will have to look into that. I mean, a lot of it, I believe, would be able to, to be able to get minimally. It's, I mean, it's requiring people to actually use it. One of our recommendations is for the PDMP um, staff to help help the abusers integrate this within their program. I know one of the complaints is that doctors are busy. We know they're busy, they don't have time to log in, look up a separate database and get the information. But other states have been able to incorporate this into that and help pharmacies and doctors see how they can use this information and integrate it into their um, current practice and have people log in ahead of time, the nurse practitioner or someone before you visit with the doctor. And so there's, there's ways they can really incorporate and do things now um, and build upon it. We do put in the report, uh, we do think this is cost neutral. We don't think that the OHA are going to need many uh, more resources. Obviously, yeah. to Jamie's point, they got to look at this thing, but we don't think this is like a massive influx of staff or anything like that or a new system. As Jamie pointed out, the PDMP systems are national. We rarely in a performance ought to find 50 states using the same thing. So it's, it's actually the right approach. It's just you know how they get there, right. but I, we don't think there's a heavy cost. Yeah, many of the way. states are using the same vendor we're using, and they've been able to expand it to include all these other data fields that we're not. The governor's office has an opioids task force, and that legislators are working on this. What's been the response uh, from them to your findings? They don't officially respond um, in a formal manner to our to our information, but we did. We are following what they're putting out there, and we did see that some of the, the <coughs> things that they've started to address align with our audit. So that's good news. And of course, we interviewed them as part of the audit and, and yep. involved them and told them what we were doing and, and obtained information from them. But yeah, they don't have a formal response. Do you have a sense, Kip, of how much more they have to do uh, to fulfill what's in the audit? Well, I think it's the uphill climb of, of changing legislation in, in America in 2018. That's a, a hard proposition as it should be, I mean, with our checks and balances. But I think if we got the legislative fixes, 
like Jamie said, they've already got the data set up. There's there's already a good modeling across the country of how to do this. They've got expertise inside the agency yes. to do this. So I think it's not if, if there's some political will to get the statute changed, then I, I think it could it can really fast track, which is why we did this audit. We know there's some other groups very hardly, you know, working on this with great intent, but we just wanted to you know, for lack of a better term, you know, light the fire on it a little bit and see if we can move this from our office a little bit differently. Yeah, are there regional differences within Oregon that you found? Mm -hmm. We um, we don't have it in our audit, but I know that that's, I mean, we don't have a map that pr we produce that has the different regional differences, but there are. There, the more rural areas, um, the more economically depressed areas tend to be higher users of, of opioids for that is kind of a national statistic. And just so I'm clear, um, with each state's monitoring program, is is there currently any state-to-state -state data sharing? Like, for example, if somebody in Portland wants to cross the bridge and get a prescription in Vancouver, is there anything that you guys would catch? Yeah, I think there is some examples of some state-to-state um, -state data sharing, and we actually did see that, that a lot of the doctor shoppers or the most egregious cases are doing exactly that. They're crossing state lines. But we didn't see a lot of that kind of cooperation. No, no. We it, again, privacy issues within the state, let alone between states. That's, yeah. you know, but uh, I and think you saw some anecdotal. Yes, and I think that it's happening in other states where they're sharing, but not here in Oregon. Oregon likes to compare itself with other states. Um, how does Oregon compare with its neighboring states, particularly Washington and California? That's an excellent question. We actually have a great um, handout that we'll hand out that compares Oregon to the neighboring states. And it has, um, it identifies several best practices. And you can see across the top is Oregon, where we haven't implemented any one of those best practices. And you can see what other states have implemented. Um, oh, sorry, I was curious about um, your uh, the tidbit about prescription stimulants. I know that meth is a significant and growing problem in Oregon. Do you know, you know, is there any link between um, use of prescription stimulants and methamphetamine use? And why did this report, you know, why choose to focus on opioids when? Methamphetamine use is also a pretty significant program here, problem here. I mean, we focused on what's included in the PDMP, but obviously to produce meth, you have to use the prescription drugs that are included in the PDMP, and so there's a direct correlation, and you're right, meth is on the rise as well, and it is a problem nationwide. Um, so we, you know, we took it at the angle of what's included in the PDMP, which includes prescription opioids and stimulants, um, and those, those are definitely used to produce I think just to answer a little more fine point on that, it's just, you know, we, we, we want to get these audits out timely, we want to do our scope, but it's a thank you for a key point, is we just don't issue an audit under Secretary Richardson and walk away from it. We are invested in these, so we do robust follow-up, we, we assist in other ways, and we'll be looking at a bigger spectrum around this issue. So in upcoming audit plans, we may take different slices, and, and in the meantime, be following up on these audits as well. So we, we really want to keep at it and, and you know, keep these things alive and moving and reporting to the public on what's going on there. Gotcha. And the, the PMP, that was designed to look specifically at opioid uh, prescriptions, or was it Opioids just like are just all controlled percent of it. substances? So it's almost 60% of the controlled prescriptions in there, of the prescriptions gotcha. included in it. So it's okay. a large portion, but it's not all. There's stimulants, there's other types of prescriptions within that. It's just the big one big portion. Where is Secretary Richardson today? Deb, I'll defer to the Chief of Staff on that one. He's in our Southern Oregon office. Deb? Yes. I'm sorry about your uh, nephew. Thank you. Uh, did you say, what's his last name? What was his last name? Elliot. Could you spell that, please? E-L-I-O-T. And is uh, Alex like conventional spelling? A-L-E-X? Yes. And where did that... What town did he live in? Where did the overdose occur? That was in Maryland, in Mount Airy. Mount Airy, Maryland. Is that one L for Elliot? Yes. How how old was he when he? Twenty nine. Any further questions? 
I do have a question about um, the 160 letters um, to individual prescribers. My understanding is the subcommittee identified some, based on the egregious kind of warning signs that these prescribers, there might be an issue. Does anybody know <laughs> like what happened with that or is it just kind of like they go out into the void and it's gone? That's exactly right. <laughs> they, okay. um, they, didn't, they, they didn't have the capability within the current statute to, to have them respond back. And so the letters went out kind of letting people know, hey, here's what's happening with your prescription yeah. um, prescribing patterns, but, but nothing else has came back from that as far as I know. Okay. Um, and is there any, um, I know somebody mentioned exempted pharmacies. Are there particular pharmacies that aren't required to comply with these? Yes, absolutely. Long-term care pharmacies. And some can give prescriptions, um, you know, both. So they may be classified, they may have some prescriptions that they, in a smaller town, that are retail. And so you may have one, one pharmacy in a town and an individual going to that pharmacy for some retail. And then by chance, maybe some of their other prescriptions are considered long-term and they're not uploaded. There's, there's, it can be problematic, but there's definitely some exemptions with certain pharmacies that are exempted to upload their data. Um, and I'm not familiar. What is a long-term care pharmacy? I think it's for like um, you know residential long-term um, okay. and like elderly care. That's interesting because with like the data on um, the most seniors who are hospitalized for opioid abuse, it's like why is why would that type of pharmacy be exempted when that's such a big problem? Exactly. And and like we mentioned and, and we have in the audit report, we, we took a couple cases where we could see their whole prescription history was not being uploaded because it looked like there were some retail and long term care pharmacies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we could see that in the Medicaid data that we matched to, but those exempted pharmacies it's not included in the PDMP. So mm -hmm. any doctor going to look at that person's record would only see the retail side of things and they were significantly missing the rest of the picture, which they were they were going to these long-term care pharmacies that weren't included mm -hmm. in the data. Oh. So that's why our recommendation to match to Medicaid, to get access to match to Medicaid would be important. This is okay. maybe a long question, so I apologize for that, but it's for all three of you. This is such a huge issue. It's been talked about so much. Yep. We all, um, no stories not as painful as the one I appreciate your sharing. Sure. Deb. What is it that that you really want people to know that might move them finally? And I, I don't mean to imply that any blame on you or anyone else. Oh sure. But how the heck do we get going on this? Well, that's a tough one. Well, we hope, you know, through our audit, you know, not to be too cliche, but there's some there's some path there. And again, I think the state's got to figure out what its strategy is. And as we as we noted, the governor's declared this an emergency. We've got a, a high powered task force, so it's a kind of an all hands. But you know, just like anything, and I'm just kind of going out on the limb here. But there's this a community issue. It's not going to be solved just by government. Um, and so, you know, the more we can educate, which is part of what we're doing here, part of how we wrote our audit report. Hopefully, it's compelling. Uh, I, I hope you turn some pages. There's some great graphics in there and things like that that really help educating folks. Because as you say, most of us know somebody in our life or in our realm that's been in fact impacted negatively by opioids. So I think there's just some will um, and just making you know a, a compelling argument how we balance privacy because that's an important uh, you know uh, U.S. you know American concept as well. But uh, you know when we see you know that we don't want to do a direct correlation just to p DMP to the actual all the metrics. It's not that simple. We have this compelling evidence from other states. This, this quite rare in performance audit show that if you if you administer the system, you're at least going to start making a dent. And maybe you can see some. It, it'll you know more data, more analysis. The more you're able to see where you have gaps and redundancies, and you can keep flourishing out the program. But I think it's will. Do you have anything to add? I was just going to echo that. My my answer was going to be that data helps us inform inform us, and it and it helps educate us and our and our policymakers on. How big is the problem? Where does Oregon stack up? Is this happening? And until we're actually using that data, looking at that data, and informing the public and others, you know, what's happening here in Oregon, you know, once you start doing that, you can't turn a blind eye to it anymore. And I think that starts getting the word out that we do have a problem here in Oregon, and we can't ignore it. And there are some actions we can take. And, you know, like Kip had mentioned earlier, the PDMP is just one tool. It's not the silver bullet, but it is an important tool, and we can use it to its its full ability. And one thing we didn't flesh out a lot because of scope and other considerations, but there's a huge fiscal cost, as you alluded yeah. to, 
uh, on this as well. Not just a human cost, but there's a there's a lot of money that can can you know in terms of you know people being prescri you know being hospitalized because of poor prescription policies that could be avoided. And so there's there's other impacts out of this that, that should draw. You know, if you can't compel them on the human side, you know, there, there's a financial side too from a taxpayer. Yeah, this is a topic that impacts so many services in so many areas and so many people. It affects our foster care program. It affects our school system. Um, those babies that are born um, addicted to, to opioids, they've got to go through the rest of their life, sometimes with learning disabilities, sometimes with extra doctors, extra care, extra strain on our programs, and, um, and, and it affects so many areas, so that's why it's so critical. Sure, I can add from the from the personal side. Um, it was quite a conversation that I had to have with my family back east if I was going to present our story. Um, there was a, a deep discussion, and my sister was just waving the flag. She said, "Tell people." So for so many years, she uh, would, was ashamed. She thought she had failed as a mom, and no more. She said that everyone who has this in their life has got to come forward and start helping each other and helping strangers. And the only way we can do that is by the things that, that we're doing, our audits, and bringing the, the numbers to light so people can see it, but then putting the human face on it and to see how devastating it is, not just to the individual substance abuser, but the tentacles that reach out to, to family. And so many of us tried to help him. And, it, and I think possibly if we had been more open about it and found out, we found out later that other families, friends, were, were struggling with the same thing and if you could have helped each other and, and created a, an internal community. Um, so, and it was very hard for me to, to tell you the story about Alex. Um, it's very emotional and it was many years of struggling. So, but I'm past the hump and I think that, that I might become uh, some kind of an advocate and do whatever I can now and, and wave the flag like my sister said and tell people and, and reach out and help. So I think, I think that is gonna make a difference, I hope. Thank you guys so much for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you all very much.